Hello and welcome to the Be Positive Bloodstream, a podcast providing insights, stories and experiences from and for all those affected by acute leukaemia and beyond. My name is John Joe Rooney and I'm the founder of Be Positive and the host of the Bloodstream. I want these podcasts to provide help, inspiration and belief to all people. Be Positive is both my blood group and my adopted mantra that I held throughout my treatment. I hope you enjoy our interviews and if you wish to get in touch with us, then please do so by emailing us at info at bepositive.org.uk or you can find us on Twitter at b underscore positive underscore org. Hello, it's me, John Joe, at the Be Positive Bloodstream. I am absolutely delighted to be joined today with an Irish compatriot of mine. Hi. Oh, you're proper <laughs> Irish, so I'm plastic Irish. Uh, I'm, three quarters, okay. I'm three quarters Irish, but um, I'm, I'm being brought It's okay, up in you the... get the flag, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a jersey. We all get the three colours. Um, I am joined by Dee, um, and Dee, you are a cellular therapy clinical nurse specialist at the Royal Marsden. Yes. So why right. have we met? We've met because I've been invited again by Flora, um, who's a friend of mine, and who's been a part of Be Positive for some years now, um, a big supporter of ours. And I was invited to give a talk, a patient talk, um, which I've done before to a group of hemo-oncology nurses and people like yourself, focusing on cellular therapy. Um, basically, you clinical nurse specialists are brilliant, and it is always a pleasure to come and speak to you guys. Um, you've very kindly given me some time after I've rambled on for a good <laughs> hour and 20 minutes about my experience, um, which I really appreciate. And I actually really think it's going to be beneficial for the people who listen I love this access to have people like yourself. So really thank you for giving me your time. Well, thank um, you for coming to speak to us. It's been really insightful, actually. It's been a great help, I think, to all of us here at the course. I'm, I'm always amazed that it's as beneficial because we're quite selfish on your patients, almost naturally. You're, you're allowed to be, but, um, and it's not so much the giving back, but I think, and I mentioned in the talk, the, the connecting people, uh, I think it's important for us to stay in touch with your, your side, but also yeah. even though patients want to get ready and get, go home, but from your side especially, and going through all the training and um, the, the academic side of it and the, the, the huge amount of weight of intellect and academia that goes with it, to have patients, probably that's why we're doing it. So it probably makes you know, a lot of sense yeah. to, to have talks like this. Oh, absolutely. And actually, as you were saying earlier, you know, it's great to see patients. You, know, you, do, you become a family. You get to know everyone so well in hospital. Yeah. Yeah. And ironically, it actually feels like sometimes patients are like kids because once you... You're well enough to go home it's like when a kid goes off to college goes on with their lives and you don't see them yeah. as much anymore it's like that's the such flow a good the analogy crew. <laughs> yeah. sadness drying yeah. their eyes it's like you're, you're happy for them to go on with their lives and then there's also that oh i wonder how they're getting on they're growing up now <laughs> and you know what it is sad yeah. and when i left worcester because i had my chemo in worcester and transplant in birmingham I, I described it in the talk of, and I, i've rumbled on to our audience about this before but they are a family and they felt like that mm. a real real tight knit, tight knit family all you want to do is get better and go home when that day came i was having pictures i was getting people my, my family to take pictures of me um wheeling out my stuff because and i felt sad and i think i it didn't take a lot for me to get upset but i was moving on but i felt really sad to be leaving that team I had to go to big daunting but i'm in the old building learn um how that hospital works, meet new people again, get that other family, but um, it's a really good analogy that people yeah. flee in the nest, essentially. Absolutely, because you do, you nice build up that rapport, and as you were saying earlier, like you do actually get to know people on a different level, because it's always different with your family, because there's that degree of where you want to protect your family yeah, from how absolutely. you're feeling, and that's actually where, when healthcare professionals come in, nurses, doctors, even as you were saying, that John Joe coming in, cleaning the floor, yeah. actually these people, because you don't know them, you can always be more honest. You can talk about your totally. fears. You can complete. You actually open up that bit easier. Yeah. And in how's a way, that for you? When we do that, how is that for you? Have you experienced you that? Know, by the way? Uh, yes. Yes. Absolutely. And it's actually good to see because then you get to know exactly what that person's going through. Because mm -hmm. actually, for us, you want to be continuously assessing. But like, it's not just a job. You're also getting to know another person. You're having a conversation with a human being, and you actually see what they are going through. And sometimes we just need to get it off our chest yeah you know, when we're upset about something sometimes actually you do just need to get it off absolutely just have that chat and just unload in a way and it's good it's actually cathartic i think to do that completely yes yeah i completely agree i i, I found it and I, I definitely found um i didn't give anyone a choice so i just let it off but um <laughs> everyone was receptive to it and I've, i mentioned again in the talk that i i was more honest not more honest i was always honest with my family but i would spare being that upset on their visits because you only get a couple of days, a couple of times a day where they can visit, and yeah. I didn't want to be bawling my eyes up. Sometimes I couldn't help it. Most days I couldn't help it. But there's a lot of giggles in that with my family, and and then when they'd go, I'd be sad, and probably then I would turn to the nurses and and they absorb all that. That's all stuff on top of them trying to do their job. They might have been putting up the chemo 
ask how you are, can see you're not well, sit down and I sat with you for an hour. That's stuff that isn't put into probably tr training manuals or, or things or there isn't mm. one way to do that. So you guys carry that. And but to be honest, that's what we want to do. And actually, right. it's hard when an area is short staffed and if you can't get to do that because there's 10 more chemos to go hang up. So actually, it's great when you have that opportunity where right, you can focus on you. It's not just giving the chemotherapy, seeing how you are going off. Yeah. It's actually good when patients are receptive to being, and they can actually know they can open up and talk to you. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. So, so you, awesome. obviously, I mean, I mean, you probably can't say no because I'm sat in front of you. But so yeah. talks like this, bringing that patient experience closer to home for you. I mean, it sounds like you found, yeah. found it valuable, but why do you think that is? Uh, well, actually, as I say, one of, one of the reasons I actually got into cancer care is uh, actually my cousin had leukemia 20 years ago. Oh, really? Well. Wow. And unfortunately, he didn't actually win his battle. Okay. And because it was 20 years ago... Different was treatment then, isn't it? Different treatment different availability like I actually still remember some of the chemotherapies like uh, Gleevec that was very copper very Gleivec, used. Yeah. he had died just before that and I still remember vividly that yeah. being in the news but uh, there's still some questions I'm wondering like what was he thinking at that time that you know it wouldn't even cross my mind yeah, to yeah, ask 20 yeah. years ago I'm thinking that's a, a really long time ago I was treated 13 years ago yeah it's only seven years difference there and it's not that much longer it afterwards. really isn't how much treatment has come yeah. on and when I was diagnosed they said you're lucky because 10 years ago you wouldn't, almost wouldn't have a chance. For adults, statistics are terrible, but yeah. for your, was your it your cousin, did you say? Cousin, yeah. So he was 18 at the time. Oh, God. Yeah. So actually, you weren't too far off in age difference. Yeah. So actually, it's kind of getting to hear in your side story what's going through. Sometimes it's actually good to think, right, did he have somebody as well when he was in hospital? Was he doing the same thing at night time? Was there enough screen in that he was actually also a yeah, note on? Yeah, personable it? element. Yeah, just to actually make him feel that bit better. Yeah. And I think. You can pace out to anyone. So when I was turned on the news in the early days of diagnosis, I could see leukemia. When I pulled out the newspaper, everything was about leukemia. But it's important to remember that I've always felt you you are your own statistic. And the word mm. leukemia, and if someone's yeah. having a bad experience, I would take that to heart. But equally, there wasn't enough people I was seeing go make it out the other end because I wasn't seeing it, because that doesn't make news traditionally. Yeah. So getting in front of people and hearing from you guys, mm. listen, the other day, and this is what brought me um, to life really was, the other day I saw someone we treated 10 years ago, John Joe, and he's absolutely fine. That gave me hope. So I think it's easy to get caught up when you're a patient, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you, yeah. th there's not one statistic for everyone. You are your own statistic, and also and you you're on your own journey. Because right. it is, it's different from everyone. No two cancers are the same, no two people are the same. Everything's yeah. subjective, and you, one people that's going through the same treatment is very different for somebody else. And absolutely. Even the family that are with them, or what they're going through, and how they're coping. It affects everyone. It's a ripple. It's just a ripple effect. Oh, it reverberates, yeah. and that is so spot on what you said yeah. because I actually I've, I've been quoted like I'm some kind of hydra. I've said before that at times I found it easier being a patient than I bet my mum or brother did or my sister because they they are helpless. And I remember my brother saying to me, "He's got four kids." He was like, "I'd give anything to change places." My older brother trying to look after me, but I, I couldn't have him change. You can't do it. But even if you could. Like people feel helpless and they want to help, and those people need help as well because it's the reason. Like we'd be positive. And these talks are, we talk to carers and things like that, and I want to hear from all sides of it because it isn't just the patient might be the epicenter of the hurricane, but there's so many people who get affected. Yeah. Do you in your role, D? I mean, you're patient focused, but yeah. you must come across oh, completely. carers and Absolutely, uh, guardians yeah. and parents and things. It's uh, all families because it's never just the patient themselves; it's who's with them. Yeah, because. What I've noticed in my experience is actually if the, whoever they're living with at home isn't coping, that can have a massive impact on the person going through it as well. Right. So you could see somebody or actually, okay, they'll accept and like, almost a matter of fact, okay, this is my treatment, this one going on, but then they've got a loved one at home that can't accept it, yeah. they lose control, and it's actually putting more pressure than Pressures, the person yeah. that is going to treatment. They're like, oh God, maybe, maybe I should be acting sick, or maybe I can't do this or that. Or yeah. And then they'll also kind of want to, they see this other person struggling it's like okay how can I give them power how can I give them control because I'm going through this and I feel like I've introduced them to this whirlwind yeah and there's the level of guilt almost and it's nobody should be feeling like that like it's no but that's so us on. interesting to hear that and and I and I mm. said I put in a bit of an ad I didn't want to waste time um worrying getting upset and and I didn't have the pressures of a mortgage or of kids or things those those are real things for people I yeah. mine was almost quite perfectly timed by accident that <laughs> I don't if you could say perfectly, if, if you could say perfectly <laughs> time for a cancer diagnosis yeah. but it could have been worse and I and I certainly felt that 
uh, I mean, it's easy for me to say now, but at the time, I, I, I certainly wasn't one to wallow at the time. I wasn't like, why me? I, I'm, I'm not trying to be a martyr, but I just didn't waste time thinking that because I think that pulled on negative energy and it just wouldn't do me any favours. What I absolutely think is that um, I'd come for a uni. I was living at home with mum. had no kids' dependencies or anything like that. had a car to run. That's about it. But that wasn't going anywhere whilst I was in a hospital. <laughs> Um, you think, unless your mother or brother well, yeah, yeah, yeah. People are running it round. In fact, it did get used to be. But, um, but, but, a bit more seriously, that there are people with real pressures of that. I mean, people. Hey, what if you didn't have anyone? That's a real. Yeah. That's a reality. What if you had a mortgage? I mean, we spoke about Macmillan. I always plug them because I do work for them. But the, um, the financial help. People just don't know what they're entitled to and what help they can yeah. get. And There's so many sides to this. And you said it's actually not known even where to go, where to find it. Yeah. And actually that's where your charity is fantastic because actually that's one thing people could Google, find it and find that information they need and yeah. somebody that's had similar experiences. Oh, absolutely. And and, mm-hmm. and and all the charities, and I mean, we spoke off air, let's say, of other things that work. And I know our kind of plan for what we're going to say is kind of game, but hey, yeah. who cares? Sorry, this yeah. is great. <laughs> no, no, no. I think this is this better. Yeah. So another question is, what is your role? We'll come on to that. Um, but whilst we're on this tangent, I think that... Um, mm-hmm. You know, we spoke earlier about 13 years ago, I was giving booklets when I was diagnosed. That, yes. They are essential for people, but they weren't right for me. And I passed them on. Maybe a podcast, I'd have, I, I think I'd have enjoyed. That's why I'm doing them. But, you um, know, I think sometimes we miss what's important for people. I think podcasts are the way to go because actually we'll get in so much more in technology. Yeah. That's not just podcasts, but apps. Because actually, as you were saying earlier, when you're diagnosed and then you're given these booklets to read, people we all do it we all just skim sometimes because yeah. actually we're thinking of so much else and sometimes you can't even focus on reading you just want to watch something and that's where where it's listen to a podcaster even apps apps are great they might have some some things to do a couple of times a day like yeah. you get these mindfulness apps yes. as well just to try and calm people Huge. down and this is the way technology is going and actually it's good that we need to avail of this and i think charities are starting to use this a bit more as well where yeah i think they are i've noticed that um and I think, I think yeah. you know, there's a lot more mindfulness going around um, where I work. I mean, Millen are partnering up with that, and you've got things like Headspace and things. Everyone's more yeah. open to it in society, so certainly where you've been affected by illness. Um, and I think there's been a big push, you know, let's not hide from the fact that it's probably been harder to get men into that world because they've been yes. less receptive. And we did speak about that before, about so, the importance of uh, men and cancer and, and how difficult it is to get, um, and you spoke about an experience you had of, of struggling to get someone to see the wood for the trees with things. Yes, yeah, so I've actually, my experience is actually working with men with prostate cancer. So right. I've dealt a lot of working with men and their partners as well. And men, they're, they're great. Like, I love working with men. They do, yeah. they come in, they chat to each other. But actually, women are great because they always, they rely on peer support. Yeah. They actually, even from a young age, women actually seek out, you know, to tell, tell each other everything. Men don't routinely do that. And where they might have general conversation, they don't often get that in depth. And I did have this one patient I was telling you earlier. Mm. He's absolutely wonderful and he loved talking to people and he was very social and very warm, welcoming person. But actually he he needed a lot, kind of he needed private space, he needed that comfort of being able to open up with people. And the thing is, I'm very aware that when I see patients in a day, they still have their whole lives when they leave the hospital. Yeah. So it's very important, I think, when Macmillan have charities near them. So he actually had a great centre near him and I told him about it many times and I said, I can set up a referral, you get to know the CNS is there. Yeah. And many men, especially when they're of the older generation as Which well. Which they would be with... Um, they respect. automatically, they link Macmillan with end of life. Yeah, correct. And this wasn't that case because actually yeah. it's better for all these CNS as well to know people when they're well, but they want such great services. So I've been, I, I kid you not, it took me 12 months, I was planting the seed. His wife wanted him to do it straight away. She was on board, but I wasn't going to make him do what he didn't want to, but I just kept plugging it and after a year he said okay I'll give it a try I was like good like you don't have to go back again yeah I'm, I'm sending them your details this is the courses mm. the first one he went the next time he came back and he was like I loved it I, wow. it was amazing Eye opener. yeah he met other people like him it he was expected to be kind of doom and gloom kind of a sad place like tears behind the back of the eyes and he was welcomed with people like gathering together as if they're meeting for coffee in town yeah. which it is and yeah he didn't realise it was that kind of social aspect and there's some people then going to yoga and he even started doing that as well. He loved wow. it. And he said, actually, life. Yeah. yeah, and he got to know people. And then as well, as well, people that understood what he was going through, what him and his wife were going through. Like you've just been travelling, having to make hospital appointments and unfortunately patients, people who do have cancer, sometimes they have that 
in the back of the mind, to leave hospital like, okay, my tests are good today, but I'm going back in a month's time. Yeah. And it's that countdown. And yeah. Actually it feels like a dark cloud above you. I had that waiting for my transplant. I got told I could, I had a couple yeah. of months to wait to a transplant. I could eat what I want, I could do anything, put on as much weight ahead of the, the intense th therapy that was going to yeah. knock it out of me. But I felt like I had a dark cloud over me all the time and I couldn't enjoy anything properly because I had this thing looming over me. Um, yeah. It sounds quite similar for, for, for this guy, but also people get into that mindset of, I, I'm a patient, so your life stops. Actually, your life's still your life, you know. Yes. And yeah. that's such a great story that this guy, yeah. I mean, I can just tell from the older generation, like to, to, to try yoga, to speak to people in a group, there's so much yeah. Alcoholics Anonymous type fear that it's this kind of impending yeah. negative space when actually it's quite the opposite. And that yeah. is because people share to people and and people are living with these things. Certainly prostate is, you know, it, it's a great treatment for prostate. Yeah. And for, for this guy to find that, I bet his wife was so made up. And I bet you were, because you were working hard for a year trying to get it took, Yeah, this. it took a long time to plant <laughs> the seeds. <laughs> it's like, I think many women do that sometimes as well. It's yeah. like trying to plant seeds, like, okay, let, let, this, let it grow. Oh, yeah, very good at yeah. that. I, th I think that's the right thing. Because then it but feels actually, like it probably becomes his decision. Mm. And maybe that's important to And him. that's the thing, and it has to be somebody's decision. And actually, it's the same thing you said, wait for the transplant. You have so many options. It's like, is this the, is the fear? Like, is this going to be the right thing for me? And yeah. you were looking as well at other people that were going through something similar or how they've done. Yes. And actually, just something I asked you earlier is, because you were 23, you were quite young when you're diagnosed. Yeah. That you relied on that extra support. Yeah. Do you think your support needs would be different now t if you were diagnosed today instead of 13 years ago? What I felt I leaned on then. Do I think I'd lean on that now? Yeah. Um, do you think it's the same, or would you need more information, less? I think with the integration of smartphones I could oh actually that could be a, a good and a bad thing because who's going to stop me looking up the internet at night reading Dr Google which is the yeah. worst thing you can do well potentially um, I got scared from reading a booklet and passed that off to my family as I said to read the step by step booklets into how to handle acute lymphoblastic leukemia if there wasn't anything positive I didn't want to read it if I was diagnosed now would I be tempted to go and find that Maybe, but actually, that that's one side of it. I could also find a podcast which inspires me and helps me get through it. I think um, I'm a people person. The one thing I think would be a constant for me is, irrespective of all the stories, I'd want to know of someone or hear from someone or listen to someone or meet someone who'd been through it and come out. You and need that peer support. I need that yeah. peer support. And I'm, I'm like that. And I was training for a marathon. I'd want thing. that. Let alone if I was going through it. I think seeing someone who's gone through what you're going through and hearing from them is a learning in itself. I don't think, irrespective of what generation almost or years gone by, 13 years to now, I think that would be the one constant. I think you always need your support network. I had amazing family and friends around me. I think you need that, but not everyone has that. But yeah. you guys are massive support in that need. I was quite open. Mm -hmm. Um, with my clinical nurse specialist and anyone I encountered during my treatment in terms of a professional environment because I, it just isn't me to bottle it up and it only comes out in other ways like filling a bucket up with water it will overflow and it did with me yeah. but some people are probably I mean I spoke about one of the guys who, who who was on the sort of journey behind me a few months who we kept bumping into each other Peter he had a different mindset to me. He was he was a lot older, and he was like, "Listen, you get fixed, and you you leave." So he he <laughs> wouldn't have. He, I he like could, that analogy, as you said earlier. Is like you go, you go to the hospital with broken bone, you get a fix. So yeah. coming in with broken bone, you want to get fixed. Absolute quote. That's what he said, and I was like, "What an incredible guy!" Um, but his mindset's different. I imagine you could leave his home with him now, and he wouldn't have once googled it because he probably would have been, "No, it's fine." I, I honestly yeah. think it wasn't a, wasn't an act, and what works for one doesn't always work for the other. But I certainly think yeah. with me. The constant things I'd I'd need some support by, from a person, but but then you still get your clinical nurse specialist. You know, robots yeah. aren't doing this treatment for us. So people, I think, sharing stories are what I would always yeah. think would work. Because it's um, one thing us being clinical nurse, nurse specialists telling you what we know from other people, but yeah. actually, when you meet somebody that has gone through it, it's completely different. Because actually, they know what it feels like yeah. to actually, as empathetic as we can be, mm. to actually, as you were describing your mucositis earlier, as yeah. Yeah. Have that difficulty eating. And actually, it's when you're talking to somebody else that might have tricks. Like, again, we have, we have yeah, dietitians here. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing when you come across people that have little tips that actually is like, 
oh, this I used to try this, you know, this was a great tablet that worked for me. It doesn't say it worked for everyone, but yeah, you get I've come across some patients who had to give themselves injections and used to be kept in a fridge and they're like, just take it out half an hour before you give it. It doesn't sting as bad. God, I'm learning loads like, now. Yeah, these, these tips these, are great. It's not me see on the internet like yeah. hacks. Not life hacks, putting like cling film over the toilet or something like that. You know, all these yeah, different yeah. things. <laughs> who, who are you pranking with that? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a yeah. prank, that's it. But, um, <laughs> but, um, and that wouldn't go around in hospital. It is. But, but actually, yeah, it's like I saw something small, you know, when chopping boards, they always have that hole at the top. And apparently that's for you to push the food through the hole into the frying pan. I didn't know that. I found that on the internet. Did oh, you really? know? That? Yeah. See, these are the things I said when I yeah. ridiculously said about cling film, because that is a prank. One, yeah, I saw something like that, which was, um, what was another one? Which, um, yeah, like the pasta you know the um the spoon for your pasta yeah there's a hole in it because mm. that's how you measure how much pasta you need for one person so if you put that in there you know you get a hole in the yeah. circle it's not just to let air through it's to, so you can measure your pasta because people never know how much pasta to do oh my god I didn't i'm teaching know you something either. now yeah <laughs> <laughs> see it works but wait it does work both ways <laughs> and i think it that was... that's what because and people actually specialists are humans and they've got a life and they've got a family and sharing things like on a more serious note, the tips about what worked for the patients, like the things you said about your yeah. tablets and stuff, I think that um, I think that's quite invaluable because what works mm. for someone might work for someone else, and that could be in the form of a podcast or you passing it on via a patient you've just mm. seen. And that's the thing because actually it's not just patients learning from the people looking after them. We learn from each patient we see as well. Yeah, I bet. And like actually, it's when you see people that start to complain of similar things or something happens. Yeah, and that's where you're like, oh, actually, this person's had the same complaint and actually they're doing this and it's just a case of recommending it yeah. on and seeing if it works for somebody else. So something I, I found that was, um, that came out of a previous talk I'd given where one of the trainee CNSs had said, um, why they, what they took from the talk is that it was just good to see someone who'd come out the other end I will touch wood. Yeah. You know, I mean, living okay, under, yeah. there's a lot of buses. The <laughs> <laughs> but what, what they, um, what they said is that we, we don't see people enough after treatment and yeah. they can now go and tell people they're treating. And I spoke to this guy who was 13 years old, he gave a talk, but people don't go back to the hospital. Now they don't expect them to, but they miss that because they care so much. And obviously, and a part of my talk was that people just want to get out. And actually that must be hard for you guys because other people to convey about saddling, there's other people following. If they could see and hear from more people and hear more stories. And it did happen to me where one or two of the nurses would say, I would ask what, you know, do people make it through? And I say, of course they do. You know, so and so is he. He's ten years. He's twelve years. He's fifteen years. They're twenty years now. But you grab onto that when you're a patient. Yeah. Well, like it's great to look at you thirteen years later. Yeah. How well you're doing now, and just what you've achieved is amazing. Mm. Like the Be Positive charity. Thanks. I was telling you, I, I actually heard of that. Yeah, before I you was brought amazed it up. Yeah, you've heard of that. I've seen it, and but seeing what you did, like running with the, the Olympic uh, torch. Torch, yeah. Uh, cycling to uh, to Germany. <laughs> oh my God. Like, I haven't what made you say this, if anyone listening. Uh, sorry. <laughs> this is totally ad hoc from D. Yeah, you, you give me the check later, right? <laughs> <laughs> just joking, just <laughs> side note, I am joking. No, yeah, 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 yeah definitely that, get that. Yeah. Um, no, but, that's really kind. But yeah. that's a, like a great to uh, being able to, and actually having a transplant has given you that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, and I'm very lucky. as terrifying as transplants can be, and I do actually work with the stem cell collections, how hard it is. Is that the cellular the therapy beginning. you do? Is that what that so is? So that's part of what I do, yes. So the, uh, I do a lot with the apheresis side of collecting cells, but uh, I also do a lot with new treatments coming out, like the CAR T cells. Yes. So as well as just Game people changer. have their stem cells yeah. back, but now the, the clever scientists are finding ways of actually manipulating that blood. And In what way, sorry? Uh, so with CAR T cells, what they're doing is actually they're genetically modifying the patient's own white blood cells. So a white blood cells should normally attack infections, but they're yeah. not attacking the cancer. So what the scientists have done have introduced information to the white blood cells so that it can actually identify the cancer like it would an infection and attack it. Rather than, it. yeah, rather than like having to take everything in one mm -hmm. hit, it can target it more. Yeah, and this is now another treatment option for people where they might be running out of options after transplants. And that's the scary part that what happens after that. If there's actually, a relapse, you mean? Yeah, if there's yeah. a relapse and now we've got these new treatments that we didn't have even 20 years ago. Incredible, yeah. The science of CAR T-cell therapy and immunotherapy and things yeah. like that blows my mind. And again, I mentioned in the talk that I, I was keen to learn that and hear about it. Felt like I had a grip of control when I had it. It, it. You can get blown by the science a bit, but I loved hearing about it. And I learned yeah. it afterwards. I even remember reading a, a, a book about my illness after I was being treated and 
still got worried because it said, well, you know, down the line you might encounter, you know, like you could yeah. live in worry if you, if you focus right. on that. And actually that's sometimes almost the downside to information or yeah. where it's good to be aware of it, but actually it's very easy to fixate it on it and to be thinking, I'm, I'm sure you've probably had the experience where every time you've had an ache, you probably think, is this just an ache because I've, I've cycled to Germany? Yeah. Or is actually, is this something else? You probably have had those thoughts over and, the last and you know, few I, years. With, I'm doing a hernia operation, quite a standard, very common thing. That was the first time, see, I, I got pneumonia when I, I'd run the marathon the second time and I had a chest infection, I did it. Oh my God. Well, I, I'd had a cough for a week which it turns out was a chest infection, but I didn't go and get it looked at because I thought they'd tell me not to do the marathon. I was convincing myself it was fine. It was quite a dry cough. And I remember being on the train going to Greenwich and, and Blackheath and a guy next to me said, yeah, I had a chest infection when I did the marathon once, nearly killed me. And I was like, oh, I don't think oh. this is a chest infection. I mean, it was. And I, I, I was well enough, it was, and probably the last half of the week I was coughing and coughing. And I didn't go to the doctors. I know, I'd ride, I'd ride a lot. You a marathon with a chest infection. I'd ride a lot of money, so I didn't want to... I look for excuses not to do the 5K park run. And you're doing one in a marathon with, with a chest infection. I feel but, guilty. I have no excuses now. But, but you're sensible because you know why you shouldn't do it. And I, I didn't. I'm an idiot. So anyone listening, don't do it if you've got a chest infection. I'd never do it again because it did nearly kill me. Certainly considering it was the early stages of my recovery. I was recovered, but it was, it was 2012. And... Um, yes, I was quite a few years down from treatment, but I was, uh, you know, I, 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 well, no one should be doing that. And it, it wasn't that it was a risk of sort of damaging me because of the treatment I had. It's really just that no one should do that. And I got pneumonia and that was as ill as I'd been since the treatment. But, um, but I'm not a panic result and I knew where that had come from. So there was no surprises like lumps and bumps. But when I had, um, few weeks ago now uh, the hernia when I was like oh this is I had bad sort of abdominal pain so I was I was, I was thinking oh this is probably a hernia but it was playing on my mind a lot and I'd 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 gone and got it looked at a GP they can't really tell but they can you know because it wasn't an obvious one and they said well let's go and get it scanned and I went to go and get it scanned and whilst they were scanning it was taking forever and it did run through my mind and I'm talking weeks ago and I'm 13 years out that but there's almost that element of PTSD in a strange way yes yeah. It's probably Shocking. going back to when you yeah. had scans even 13 years ago. Like you said, when you're waiting in that waiting room, not picking up in any cues that something serious was going on, you were thinking about going and get a McDonald's. Yeah, and, and I was blown out of my comfort zone then. Whereas here, I'm preempting, and I think you're right, PTSD mm -hmm. with it. Um, I, I was like, but do you know what I had to tell myself? I had to have a word with myself, as you say. I was there, and he, and he was scanning my abdominals, and, and the... the um, Radiologist? What's some Yeah, the radiologist. Yeah, radiologist. He, he, he was scanning away and and he'd gone down the groin and everything where, where it was, when he was going up up my abdominals and things, which obviously you can get hernias there, but he was very quiet and this was a long, long scan. And in my mind, I thought, God, I hope this isn't bad. And I, and I, I wasn't really being myself. I was quiet. Girlfriend had picked up on it. Um, it's not like me because I just don't worry that much about things. Um, I worry about my football team more than anything. Jesus. <laughs> Um, but I'm not really a, a, a nervous type person like about a lot of things. Um, but this was worrying me and, and it was quietly worrying me. I almost didn't want to admit it. Probably interfering with my sleep a bit. And I'm only talking about a few days, oh a period of a few days. And when I was lying there, I thought, even if this is bad, I'm still in the best place because this needs to be seen. I didn't want to accept it would be. I said, it probably isn't. Let's talk sense. It's t it should be a hernia. Everything looks like it is. But... It's hidden, it's lumps. I've had lumps before behind my ears which turned into leukemia and things like that. So, you know, lymph nodes been raised and things. So I just had a few moments where I thought, but, but me not being here wouldn't make this better. I need this scan. And trying to rationalise that. That's a great outlook to have in it. It actually yeah. just take it as it comes in a, in a way just to see what it is first because it's yeah. very easy to get panicked straight off. Totally. Thank God at least you know it is just a hernia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least it is that. I mean, not just a hernia, I know you no, still no, going to it, but... But of course, people are, you know, and I've been mm. elsewhere, I've been 13 years ago where I didn't think it was anything, and it was. Mm. So I think, um, I think the, the lesson for that is, and I've always, always going to get something checked out, because you can worry yourself sick, but I felt instantly better when they said, yeah, you've got a scan booked. Just because I knew a scan was booked, I knew it would be corrected, or they'd find mm. what needs to be done. Because actually you're taking action, it's the best thing to do, and yeah. A lot of people control yeah it's sometimes they ignore a lot of things as you said not just because they're not known 
what to look out for. But a lot of people, even just day to day life, they're like, oh, I don't have time for this. I don't have time to get checked out. Yeah. That's uh, it's a big thing that actually that contributes to later diagnosis. Yeah, of well, it would do. Of anything, like not just people looking, avoid yeah. it. Yeah. Put it off. Mm. Um, this is brilliant. I'm really enjoying it. Um, well, sorry. We no, no, no. Go no absolutely <laughs> fine. I think we've pretty much covered a lot. I suppose the last thing we had was just to talk about um, giving and receiving information. Well, we actually we touched on it, saying leaflets and things aren't the best way. Maybe yeah. podcasts are. But from your actual experience, do you have instances where people find questions at you and they're, they're literally clueless? And I remember speaking to Adele Fielding, and she said sometimes when they diagnose someone, you perhaps don't need to diagnose someone, but we turn to you when we're a patient because we've had all the um, really hard hitting stuff, and then you're our day, not day to day, but you're, you're, you're our sort of, and um, the people we're closer to. Mm-hmm. And what Adele said is when they diagnose, they, they work out what's right for the person, and if they can see they're getting an overload of information, they'll pause and say, let's take a breather, let's get a coffee, or let's speak yeah, tomorrow. To put back, yeah. Do you f- that for me feels revolutionary that people can do that. Yeah. Because often we, I was used to given the news and that's it. Because you could see that a lot, especially uh, when it comes to some of the treatments, like transplants, there's so much involved in it that you would have, that actually it's very easy, you're not going to remember every, everything, everything that's discussed with a doctor, and sometimes it's good even to have a cup of tea after a doctor, then sit down with a CNS and talk about things again, even if it's repeating stuff, because actually you take stuff up a second time. Yeah. That would have been said initially, but... Absolutely. It just is a difference of actually being told something and it actually having time to digest it. That's so right, and actually you just reminded me, 13 years ago, that's what happened to me. Mm. I wasn't listening after I told the bad stuff. Yeah. They talk to you gradually, and they reaffirm stuff, and they explain, so they expand on stuff. That's so useful, I think. Yeah, and actually, booklets are great, because that's where they can fill in what you don't remember or didn't take in yeah. at the time. It's good to have written information, but actually, sometimes, when you're feeling overwhelmed, written or not, it's not going to help, and actually, yeah. this is where technology is helping out more. It's where actually if you can actually listen to a podcast or watch a video on YouTube, because you can stop it, listen to what you want, stop it, go back, listen to it again yes. at a later stage. The, again, and sometimes control, you're, you're on your own time, yeah. you're in control of your own sort of life there. That's huge. And sometimes you just need to actually get it away from the room when you're told some news, you just need to almost go outside or sit down and have a cup of tea, because yeah. you just actually need to have that, that process of just staring into space just while you're digesting what's going on, Absolutely. what's happening. Yeah, it can feel overwhelming yeah. and having yeah. that time to s- sit and digest it, but also have that person to go back to, yeah. you know, which I'm sure you've encountered where I've you've had, had. And I've often had the same conversations with people again and again, yeah. just because the first time, because they're trying to get their heads around, because like, especially for you, like leukemia, it's not an easy thing. It's no. Everything about it's it is complicated. Yeah. Everything and what it is to how to treat it. Because it's not Nothing visual as well. Yeah. I think that doesn't help it. Yeah, it's not like when, let's say if you did break a bone, you can actually see the pain, feel where it is. Yeah. And you know what needs to be fixed. Yeah. You can see it straight away in an X-ray. Yeah. Leukemia, you're having multiple different tests, mm. multiple different scans. It's all this collection of different things. Nothing is straightforward, and it's different for some people as well. Like there's so many different types, even of having what you had. You had a AML, was it? ALL. ALL. Yeah. And there's different types of that as well, and yeah. different parts of your cells Strands that are affected. It, yeah. And that's where it's different for everyone. And actually, even when you're reading booklets, the case is this actually applicable to me? Yeah. Or because it's written yeah. to throw out there, but everyone's different and everyone takes things differently. Yeah. I think that personal connection is brilliant. This has been absolutely fascinating Sorry, and thanks yeah. so much for your time. No problem. Thank you very much for even just coming in to talk to us because no. actually you telling us your story, hmm. it's quite brave of you to do because it's, it's really living a part of your life that wasn't the easiest. Yeah. And showing what you've gone on from then, it's actually, it's inspiring to see what you've gone on to do because that's what we all want is CNSs and nurses and doctors, all healthcare professionals. You want to see patients do what you've done to actually get better and go on living your life, make some positive changes in your life. Yeah, that's, that's um, certainly a takeaway yeah. I've got when I've given these talks that people, you guys want to see that. Um, and we should encourage more of it. I certainly share content where people yeah. have done that because I think that would A, lift you guys, but yeah. crucially lift those people who are going through it. God, what a pleasure. I've loved this. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank no you, Dee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.